Let's go ahead and get in our Bibles this morning in Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews chapter 11. Our subject in the uh, main hour is faith of our fathers here that we've been dealing with. I've uh, very much enjoyed studying this uh, next week and the week following Thanksgiving, the Sunday following Thanksgiving, and possibly even the next Sunday here, depending on how excited and how much we want to develop these thoughts. We want to end up around uh, our nation and some of the things that were very evident, very evident in the beginning of America. And so we've been pretty much laying a foundation of what uh, is faith. And last week we talked about the definitions of faith. And we came all the way up to basically faith is trusting God in His Word. We found that it wasn't uh, something that can be generated through some just so-called experience, but it has to be something of God. It's a supernatural thing that's given to us. We talked about that a little bit in the first hour. And we found that in the life of Noah last week, just by way of review, it causes man to move. It does something in his life. You know something? It's real. And that's going to be our first point today when we get to it. Faith is real. That's why it makes a difference. That's why testimonies are fantastic, because you're talking about a real experience of a real life by a real God. Amen. And there's an effect. It always causes man to move. We read last week in Hebrews chapter 11, that verse in verse 7 about Noah, by faith Noah, being warned of God of things not of not seen as yet, moved with fear and prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Faith will cause man to move. And, of course, true faith always causes man to move in the right direction. The Bible says it's repentance toward God. So people say, well, repentance is just a change of mind. Well, yes, but it's greater than that if it's saving faith and repentance because it changes your mind, changes your direction, changes your motives, changes your will. It's just a a work that continues uh, to do a great thing. And we saw last week it affects our walk and what we, the direction we're going. Sometimes God causes us to wait that we can grow in patience and learn to trust Him. We dealt with a little bit uh, last week about that and this morning. And then also there's a work that begins in our life. Faith causes a work to be done in our life. In fact, again, faith can be seen. And that's really going to be our um, our emphasis this week. And I'm glad the Lord stopped me last week where he did because we have a few things more that we were able to add in. Let's go and read Hebrews chapter 11. Let's stand real quick. Let's wake ourselves up. Let's get some energy. Let's get some blood flowing there. And... We're going to read just two verses here, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, and then uh, verse 6. All right, let's read those together. Those are the two verses we're going to talk about today, and if we get through those, we've done well. All right, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. The definition here, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. Verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You may be seated. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father, we're thankful again to be able to read your word this morning. We thank you, God, that it is truth. And uh, we can trust every word, every jot, every tittle. We thank you, Lord God, that it's settled in heaven. We don't have to wonder if it's going to be different tomorrow, but we can learn it and uh, believe it, Lord, today. I pray that you would help us, God, to deal with this subject of faith. Help us, Lord, to grow in our faith and be increased in our faith, as we learned in the Sunday school hour. And God, help us to bear fruit for you in our life. Help us, Lord, to realize that faith is real. It's not something out there that we can't take hold of, but, Lord, rather it's something that can take hold of us and can be seen by our testimonies. And, uh, God, uh, to just let you work in our life, I pray that that would be our wills today, that we'd be submitted to you and say, God, do something in my life. I pray we would ask you, Lord, not only to... Uh, just thanking you for that you did save us, Lord, when we were born again. But God, if we're here today and we're not where we need to be in our lives with you, I pray that we'll just be willing to submit and to do all that we can, Lord, to have your will fulfilled in our life. And to God, of course, if there's one that's not saved without Christ today, we pray that they would receive you as their Savior, that they would see their need, 
and God trust you by faith and be born again and have a testimony as well, Lord, like many of us here do today. And we'll thank you, God, as a result of what's said and done, what's read, of course. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith works. Amen. Um, this is a thing that's very interesting. And as we're dealing in the afternoon hour with evolution and in the first hour in many of our Sunday school classes, people often accuse us of having blind faith. They say, you believe in something that you can't even see. Yet, I want you to look at these key words in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance. Substance. Well, they always say, if I could see it, if I could feel it, if I could taste it, if I could hear it. But the Bible says faith has substance. So it's not blind faith. It's not imaginary faith. It's not invisible faith. According to the Bible, we see an invisible God through faith, the Bible says. We see Him who is invisible. How? By faith. And so the Bible gives us words here that actually show to us this faith isn't imaginary. And you know that, those of you who are saved. But often in the world we get that accusation. You believe in something you can't see. Well, I, I submit to you today that maybe we might not be able to see in your heart the very working of God, when you were born again, I could see in your life that God made a difference. See, when we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, so faith is real. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 11 here. We're going to look at this idea that faith is real, and we're going to see how it applies to this uh, chapter 11 and, and find in Hebrews that it refers to the three aspects, and we're going to deal with three things, and we're going to liken it to a fruit. Liken it to fruit. In fact, the Bible has a lot to say about fruit, especially in the Christian life. And uh, we're going to look at some of those verses as well. Let's, let's get into it here. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Amen. So when a person is born again, we have in our life something that is called fruit. Fruit. And when we have faith in our life working, when we've been born again, there's going to be fruit. You believe it? You agree with that today? Let's go to Matthew chapter uh, 7, if you would, please. Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to look at a verse there that Jesus says about fruit. About fruit. When he was warning us of false prophets, he said the way you'll know they're false prophets, the way you'll know they're false converts, the way you'll know they're false teachers, and wolves in sheep's clothing is their fruit. But he also used this opportunity to teach us something about the Christian life, that we also bear fruit. That's good, amen. So a changed life will not just change a direction, the way you walk, what's working in your life, what you're interested in, where you're going, but it'll also change the whole dynamic of your life, what you're bearing, what you're becoming, amen. A tree bears fruit if it's left to grow long enough, and God often uses those words of fruit. In fact, as I was studying this yesterday, I found the word fruit, fruits, and fruitful is hundreds of times in the Bible referring to what we are and what the wicked are. Often it's referring to the word fruit, 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 fruit. All right, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, let's read that together. Uh, I, we read that, I apologize. I told you to go to Matthew chapter 7. Go there, Matthew chapter 7. And we read there in... Uh, verse number 16. Watch what he said here. Matthew 7, verse, well, look at 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You can't see the wolf because he looks like a sheep, but you can see the sheep's life if he says he was a sheep. And we agree there's people that say they're saved and are not saved. Amen. I was one of them before I got born again. I didn't know that, but God knew that. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 16, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? What is he saying? You associate figs growing on a tree, not in the stickers. You associate good fruit as grapes, and you don't gather grapes in the thorns, do you? He's saying there's a clear, distinct difference of good fruit and bad fruit. And we need to bear good fruit. We get to that. The Bible says here, verse 17, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. Should that be you and I? Yes, it should. The distinction. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Christian, we need to be reminded, by the way, too, if we're a Christian, we need to live like a Christian. Amen. 
And we should be living the type of life that is bearing the image of God, bringing forth fruit, as the Bible says, under perfection, in fact. Verse number 18, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It shouldn't be that way. Amen. In verse 20, wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. Well, what is it, of course, that brings fruit into our life? It is real saving faith. Go back to Hebrews chapter 11 again. Real saving faith. The substance is real. Uh, often I've had people accuse me and say, well, what you've done is all just a matter of what's taking place in your mind. You just think that you've had a Christian experience. You've, uh, you've just believed that something happened to you. Well, yes, I have believed and I know something has happened to me. I can see the difference in my life. Amen. As we heard the testimony this morning of a young man, who knows something happened in his life. He might not understand all of it, but he knows something changed the day he got born again. Amen. And so we have the substance. It's real. Why does faith work? Because it's real. Would we submit today that it's possible that some people who say they have faith and they wonder they might not actually have true saving faith? Amen. You can't see it working in their life. It often happens that way. Secondly, faith is rational. We see the evidence of it. Go uh, back with me here to Acts chapter 17. There's evidence everywhere around us uh, that faith is rational. Often they say, well, you've got to believe a fairy tale. No, you just have to believe the truth. You have to open your eyes and open your ears, and God will speak to you not only through creation but through the Word of God. Number one, faith is real. Number two, it is rational. We see the evidence all around us. Uh, go to Acts chapter 17 here, and we'll read something that Apostle Paul said. Can we stop this for a minute and realize that there is a difference between the way Acts chapter 2 was preached and Acts chapter 17 was preached? When Apostle Paul was preaching in Acts chapter 2, he was preaching at Pentecost to believers who believed in the Messiah, were looking for the Messiah, and they turned to the Messiah. Amen? The Bible says he, he preached unto them repentance and that they should turn from their wicked ways, trust Christ, and they believed on Christ. But in Acts chapter 17, Paul's dealing with a different group of people. He's dealing with these philosophers. He's dealing with these Epicureans and the Stoics, these great men of knowledge. And what they were is many of them were agnostics. They weren't like the Jew of Acts chapter 2. Apostle Paul didn't treat them the same way that Peter treated the Jews that were looking for the Messiah in Acts chapter 2. You know what he did? He took them to the idea that if they would realize rationally, they could find God. And they could see Him if they if they just go after Him. Notice what it says here in uh, Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 27. Verse 20. Uh, well, look at... Uh, oh, Lord, help me here. Verse 22, let's get there. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mar Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens... I perceive that on all things you are too superstitious. Notice he didn't say religious. He said superstitious. He said, For I passed by and beheld your devotions, and I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. What was the first thing that Paul mentioned to people that were not believing in the true and living God? According to the scripture, verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein. This is an important foundational thing when we begin to talk to people about faith is the idea that we have a creator and that he created all things. It will make a difference. Because if a person believes this word, believes in the creator, then you have something to tell them about how they can be saved and trust that creator. We need to understand that if we're going to reach the world in the time that we are, we're going to have to deal with the, the, the issue of creation and evolution. We need to get them to realize we have an almighty creator. We have been created. Everything you see is his creation, and he had a purpose in creating you and bringing you into this world, and he had a purpose of himself coming into this world to save you, to save you. This is, I believe, something we need to remember. We can't just... All of a sudden, get right into the gospel with people. We need to get a foundation sometimes because often they won't believe the gospel because they believe the idea of evolution, believe we came from nothing. So you deal with that sometimes first and get them over to where they can get to the cross. 
if you would, a foundation. Paul started with that. He said, Neither, verse 25, is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Sounds like he's dealing with a creation issue to me. So we didn't just happen, guys. God gave you life. That's good, isn't it? And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now watch verse 27. That they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him, don't miss these next words, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You say, how far away are people from getting saved? Simply saying, I want to see the truth. That's how far away they are from seeing Christ and being born again. If a person just rationally looks at the gospel, looks at the difference it's made in the lives, looks at the difference it's made in countries, looks at the difference it's made in societies, looks at the difference that it's made in time, since the time of Christ, they'll say, rationally speaking, there's never been any other religion that has made more of a difference in this world than the religion of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, that's a great argument when you're dealing with people. They say, well, what if you don't, what if Jesus isn't, is just one of the choices? No. No. Any of those false religions never made the difference that the religion of Jesus Christ made. Rationally speaking, look at it. It continues to make a difference. It's not a lie. It's truth. Amen. So there is rational, and they often say you're irrational. Faith is irrational. No, it's 100% rational. In fact, back there in Hebrews chapter 11, God says here, it's not just the substance of things hoped for. It can be seen. It can be touched. It can be taken hold of. But he also said it's the evidence of things not seen. What is admissible evidence in court? Something that is real. Amen. You're not going to allow, to be, court won't allow something in that as evidence that's not real. And God says faith is real. There's evidence. It's not invisible. It's uh, able to be seen, and it's very rational. And can we not say today with great joy to the Lord of all the great miracles that God has done? How do you look at all the people that have literally been raised up from the dead? How do we look at it, Mary? I mean, even if we weren't even people of religion today, if we could see what God has done in healing people, we would have to rationally say there has to be something greater than man. There is something working behind the scenes. And I thank the Lord for that testimony of the doctor when we were months in the hospital with Mary. And he looked at me and said, I don't understand how your daughter is alive, but I know something else is greater at work here than we are. Amen. Now, that's an intelligent man. That's a man who came to the conclusion by what he was seeing that there was something beyond this world that is working. You know what faith is? The substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And you can see real saving faith in somebody's life. And you can see a real God working because there's an evidence. There's an evidence. It's, it's rational. It's right before us if we'll just open our eyes and see it. And, of course, again, with science, there's perfect order. The way that everything is working together in a perfect 24-hour day and seven days a week and how all this time works all together with all the seasons is absolutely saying this has a great almighty God that created everything we see, a perfect order. We see evidence all around us. And, of course, we recognize that there is a reason. There is The idea here that we need to understand, again, is that faith is real. Amen. Faith is real and it's rational. It's rational. If a person would just open their eyes and say, I want to see if it's real, God will say, here it is. Here I am and here's the truth. But number three, we also see here um, that faith is rational or relational. Excuse me. Faith is relational. And, and this is something we have above all other so-called faiths. If you study the Muslim religion, they will say to you, we pray to a God that we do not know. We pray to a God that does not hear our prayers. That's actually what they believe. And he does not speak to us. I like the old song that says, uh, I know God is real because he spoke to me today in my heart. And uh, the old time singer said, you ask me how I know it's real. These things I just can't explain. All I know is this heavenly tug I can feel on my heart strings. People say, well, do you hear an audible voice? No, it's just the peace of God. You sense his presence in your life. You see his guiding hand because he's relational. He sits down from heaven and he looks at you and he says, I love you. How many times have you been in church and you feel the peace of God come upon you and you say, I'm saved by the grace of God. I know the Lord. Faith is relational. 
Faith is relational. And of course, this is why the devil attacks the faith so great because he knows that if you begin to trust Christ, somebody here today who's questioning and saying, is God really real? Because if you begin to accept the Bible's true and Jesus Christ and the work on Calvary was done for mankind, but also for me, then he knows the next step, next step in your life is you're going to say, I want him to be my savior. And you'll come to relationship with the father through Jesus Christ. That's why there's such a great attack in these areas. Notice Hebrews chapter 11 here. Watch this now. According to the Bible, one can actually have a relationship with God. Think about that. A relationship. Not just a knowledge of God like we find of the world. They knew God in a general way, but now we can know Him personally. Personally. Notice it says these words in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Look at this. He that cometh to God. Wow. The door's open. Amen. John chapter 10, Jesus said he was the door. And by him, if any man enter in, he can be saved. We can come to God through this great faith. Faith is very, very relational. Amen. And aren't you glad that God doesn't leave you alone after you got saved? I am. It says he that cometh to God. And God continually wants us to draw near unto him. The Bible is full of verses on that. And of course, he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We can come to God. Notice Psalm 34 here. Let's go there, Psalm 34. Faith is real, we see the substance. Faith is rational, we see the evidence. But also here, faith is relational. You say, I don't know how to argue everything about science. Neither do I. I don't have every answer. Uh, you say, well, I'm not really quite sure how I can explain to people God's presence and the fact that He can save them. I know he's real. I know he's done a work in my life, but I'm not quite sure how to relate that. How do I talk to someone about that? Here's what you've got in the end. You've got what Jesus did in your life. And as we saw this morning, there's power in testimony. There's power in testimony. Faith is real, and it does a real work in our life, and it's relational to the point where Hebrews chapter 11 says that we can come to God and it's sweet. Amen. It's sweet. So many times we find this reference in the Bible. But look at this one verse in Psalm 34. Psalm 34. And that's what's wonderful about something that you enjoy. Do you know what people talk about? Something they love and something they enjoy. Often that's their focus of life. Why is it that the believer who gets born again runs around everywhere and starts telling everybody about Jesus. You know why? Because they got a taste of God. Psalm 34, David said this in verse number 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't know about you, but I like, when I eat something good, I want to share it. I say, this is so good. Often I'm off somewhere, and I'm visiting, or I'm doing something, and I'll have the privilege of sitting down and eating a wonderful meal. You know what I think of? I think of my wife. I say, I wish she was here. I wish she was here that she could enjoy this wonderful meal. Often we've had great meals. I mean, you know, the wife, she gets them all spread out. She's got the pickles in the relish jars, and she's got it all. And I mean, you're taking pictures. This is amazing. You know what comes to my mind? I wish I could have somebody here to share this meal with tonight. When you've got something good, you want to share it with everyone. When, you, when it's bringing you joy in your life, you say, I want to share this with those around me. That's salvation in our life. See, it's not that we've just experienced something real. It's not just that we know that what we've done is rationally right, but we also have something that's relational. And we say, no, 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 you've got to meet who I've met. You've got to know what I know. You've got to taste and see what I've got. This is sweet in my life, amen. I, what I found in my life was the best thing that I ever needed. One man said it this way the other day. He said, uh, why would you get so mad? I visited with Pastor Heller here yesterday. He said he was witnessing to a man, and the man got real upset at him. And he said, why would you get upset at me for, I believe it was Brother Heller, why would you get upset at me for giving you and talking to you about the biggest problem that you've always wondered about your whole life? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? And where am I going? Every person rationally thinks about that at some point, but they push it aside or they suppress it with drugs or alcohol or things in the world to make them happy. But every person is troubled with that. They know in their heart something's not right. And so when we come, we give them exactly what they've been looking for. 
a real God. Amen. And so often we find so many people have had these instances of false religion and they just need to get the real religion in their life. Amen. The real God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because once you've tasted and seen that the Lord is good, brother, you're, you're just not satisfied with anything else in this life. And I just thank the Lord that that's one of the side effects of getting saved. Amen. I am not satisfied with anything but God and His Word anymore. Some of those things in the world that we think will bring us temporary uh, satisfaction, and as soon as that sin is, oh, oh you got to do more. You got to be more happy. You, get, you know, you got to find something else. You got to buy more. It just doesn't work. Nothing in the world is going to make you satisfied. Amen. Let's go to John 15, and we'll close here. John 15. Let's bring this down to us. Where are we right now? Think about how you got saved. Somebody shared the word of God with you. Someone had received God's word by faith and got born again. And they began immediately to bear fruit in their life. But isn't it interesting that if you cut fruit open, you'll find something in the middle of that fruit? More seeds. Those seeds have a purpose. Yes, it's part of the makeup of that fruit. But those seeds have a purpose to continue the work that was begun. Amen. Trees are great, but you can't have any more if the seeds don't go in and be planted again. And I think of the faith, what came in our life when we got born again. Look at the seed. Think about it as what 1 Peter 1.23 says, the Word of God, the incorruptible Word of God. It's the seed that worked in our life that sowed faith and brought forth faith, and now we can bear fruit. Guess what God said? It's not. It doesn't end there. Let's take what God gave to us in our life and share it and plant it in the lives of those around us. And guess what? they will bring forth much fruit also. Let's look at some verses here in John, and we'll close. John chapter 15, very excited about this here. In fact, according to the book of Romans, God says we're now to bear fruit unto holiness. This is what we're to be. We're to be bearing fruit unto holiness. That old fruit and the death and the different sin that worked in our life before, we don't want that fruit anymore. We want fruit unto holiness. And John 15, beginning in verse number 2, he said, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Yes, God wants to bear fruit in our life by faith. Would we say today again, faith is linked with fruit. The greater our faith, the more our fruit. Amen. We need to understand that. Go uh, over there, uh, back on to verse number 16. Verse number 16, we'll see something there. Verse number 16, it says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now let's look at this picture for a minute and understand something. Faith worked in our life and brought forth fruit. But according to this verse 16 of chapter 15, we find these words, and ordained you. Do you know what the word ordained actually means in the Bible? Prepared of God. So God prepares faith in us to share with others so that that faith, like this seed, can bring forth fruit in others. Right now, God's done a work in your life, and it doesn't end there. You and I need to share our faith with those around us. Amen those around us. Well, actually, that's our, our last uh, slide this morning. So let's go to verse 8, and we'll close with this. Verse number 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So, so shall ye be my disciples. I wonder here, as we think of our own life, what is it that we can allow God to change? As the Bible says, in verse uh, number two, he prunes us. He purges us. He takes away the things that keep us. Let me, let me ask you something. Is there anything in your life today as a Christian that perhaps might be a distraction from having God's will and his work in your life being meted out so that you can bear more fruit? What's distracting you from reading your Bible every day? What's distracting you from having a prayer and and study there at your house in a time of devotion, if that's not happening right now? What is it that's taking your main efforts away from what you're to be doing to bear fruit in your life, where your roots should be going down deeper? Is there something today in your life that you could say, God, I need to 
bear more fruit. I want to bear more fruit. I want you to be glorified. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And this is the thing that's great about our testimony. It doesn't stop when we get saved. God wants to continue that work in our life. And His His, His will that we would be glorified, that the Father would be glorified in us. And, and our glorification, if you study that, He that glories, glories in the Lord. It's never about us. It's always about what God is doing in us. That's glorification, amen? The more of God coming through our lives. And uh, it's just good to, to study this this morning. Faith is real. It has substance. Faith is rational. It's the evidence of things not seen. And faith is relational. Hebrews eleven six. We can come unto God by faith. And we need Him just as much today in our life as we did when we got saved. Let's close with this one verse in Colossians 1.10. Colossians 1.10. We look at Paul's prayer in verse 9. And I believe that Paul prayed in the Spirit. So you know what that means? What Paul is praying is what God wants in our life too. Now let's think about that. What Paul's praying for is what God wants in our life as well. This is what he was praying for in the Colossians' life, those at Colossae that were believers. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, look at this, being fruitful in every good work. Hey, praise God. In increasing in the knowledge of God, sounds like we're bearing fruit, but God wants us to bear more fruit. Amen. In every area of our life, not just some areas of our life. Let's stand here for the invitation. Stand for the invitation.